Good evening and welcome. On behalf of the team from Brown University and all those who've helped to make this event possible, I'd like to welcome you to our climate action webinar and introduce you to the co-moderators for this evening. As one of the moderators, uh, I'm Michelle Morantz and I'm chair of the Longmeadow Democratic Town Committee and the Longmeadow Pipeline Awareness Group. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the second moderator, Linda O'Connell, who is Community Outreach Director for the Springfield Democratic City Committee. Linda? Thank you. It is wonderful to see so many people here from all over Massachusetts. I anticipate that by the end of our time together tonight, we will be floating on the awesomeness of scholarly rigor combined with our activist power. Months ago, when Linda and I learned of a study conducted by Brown's Climate and Development Lab Institute, our interest was piqued, particularly because the study focused on the fate of almost 300 climate action bills as they traveled through the Massachusetts legislature over a six year period. To no climate activists' surprise, the study found that in Massachusetts, quote, despite strong public support for climate action, most pro-climate bills and legislative priorities fail before even reaching a vote, unquote. And this in a state that was, quote, among the first in the United States to commit itself to economy-wide climate change action through the Global Warming Solutions Act, unquote. In short, what the study sought to explain was how such a progressive state could have a climate legislation record that so dramatically contradicted that image. Our joint response to that grim conclusion was to organize this webinar so that these scholars would have a Massachusetts forum in which to explain their findings. We also hope tonight that we also hope that tonight will provide seasoned climate activists political insights that will make them more effective strategists and convince experienced politicians in the audience to place climate action at the top of their to-do list. So here's what tonight's format is going to look like. First, we'll open with a slide presentation by the Brown team with an audience Q&A to follow. At 8.15, the large session will dissolve into three breakout groups according to topic, biomass resistance, pipeline resistance, and climate action in general. And at 8.50, we'll return to the plenary session for concluding remarks. And we would be remiss if we did not thank our powerful co-sponsors for this event. So Irvine, if you would share the slide, we're not going to name everyone. We hope everyone will just take a quick look. And we are so thankful for our sponsors here. As you can see, we have Democrats and activists climate activists, community activists who have been working on climate uh, together pushing for this program and this kind of dialogue. Thank you, Irvine. So now to introduce the main event, our presenters. First with us is Timmins Roberts. Timmins is the Idelson Professor of Environmental Studies and Sociology at Brown University, where he directs the Climate and Development Lab and the Climate Social Science Network, a new global organization focused on understanding climate obstruction organizations. His research seeks to understand the obstacles to climate action, climate change in the United States and globally. We have also Trevor Colhane, a researcher at Brown's Climate and Development Lab. Trevor's research focuses on understanding how governmental and non-governmental actors mobilize to undermine climate action at the state level in the U.S. with a particular focus on industry actors in New England. And Galen Hall, also a researcher at the Climate and Development Lab, 
His research focuses on state level climate and energy politics and organized climate obstruction at the national level. Timmons, you have the stage to begin your presentation. Thank you, Linda. That was a very generous introduction. And um, I, I swear this is the best uh, organized Zoom call I've ever been on. And I've been on a lot of Zoom conferences. Um, so at some point, Galen's going to pull up our slides. Um, but I want to thank Linda, Michelle, Irv, Irvine, Frank, and Amy for all your help on this. Um, yeah, again, it's great organizing. And you all have assembled really the kind of um, audience, the kind of people that we wish to reach with this research. That is, we don't want research that sits on a shelf or is just in the classroom um, or in the lab. We're, I want always for my work with my students to have an impact. And I just think there's great potential in academia to do so much more that is of, of use to um, solving social problems. So our Climate and Development Lab has been going about 10 years. For a long time, I was taking students to the UN climate negotiations around the world and doing policy research that we would present there. Now we've shifted to the United States when, when uh, President Trump uh, withdrew from the Paris Agreement. I decided to bring the team back home and we've started going to Washington DC and presenting to senators and Congress people and their staffers to journalists and experts and activists. But um, th this project, I've always worked at home and um, I've been involved in Rhode Island um, trying to get climate change legislation passed uh, for the last um, dozen years now. Since I moved to the state, we did manage to pass two bills, the Climate Risk Reduction Act in 2010 and then the uh, Resilient Rhode Island Act in 2014. And in all those, and then we spent six years trying to pass a carbon, um, carbon fee and dividend bill, which never made it out of committee. And so I have a lot of experience with testimony. I was a registered lobbyist for a couple of years for our carbon pricing bill um, and uh, continue to support our, our legislation, which looks like it's moving actually for the first time. It will be the first bill um, to move out of committee uh, on, the, on the issue of climate change in seven years in Rhode Island, um, if um, knocking on wood here, if things move forward. Um, so I knew a lot. Um, and uh, in, present, in one of those presentations of the president of the Barr Foundation, which is, of course, extremely important in Massachusetts uh, and around New England on issues of clean energy and climate, saw one of our slides about who was opposing climate action in uh, Rhode Island and said, we need that in Massachusetts and in Connecticut. So we've been funded for these two years to do a study in Massachusetts, and now we're starting to collect data also on Connecticut. Um, and uh, again, I wanna thank them for that funding. None of what we're saying is their responsibility. It's ours. So next slide, Galen. Um, I wanna talk about what we have to do on climate, and I'm gonna be super quick. You all know this. I mean, the impacts are, are massive. Uh, they're all over the state of Massachusetts, not just the coast, but especially the coast. Um, but this shows that if we had acted just even 10 years ago, we could be reducing our emissions by just 3.7% a year. But now, because we really have not peaked our global emissions, we're now up to 9% a year. We really need uh, a Green New Deal, or we need some kind of uh, extremely active um, approach to, to reduce our emissions. This is if we're going to stay below one and a half degrees of warming, which uh, you know, the big international panel, the IPCC, um, uh, determined w would be the probably the a much better threshold to stay under uh, if we want to avoid those nastiest of impacts. And of course, every degree, every tenth of a degree matters when it comes to climate change. Next, so the nat the national level is where one would like to deal with climate change. Um, you know, Obama came in in, 20, in 2010 and had both houses of Congress, um, but then his um, when the Waxman-Markey bill made it through the House, but then um, never could get the 60 votes in the Senate. So it never came, they never brought it to the floor. His, his clean power plan that he put forward, uh, which was the core of our pledge in the Paris Agreement, which was 26 to 28% uh, emissions reductions by 2025, it relied entirely on the states. So just to say that um, we have a federalist system, even all the Biden executive orders that he's put forward to rely on states carrying out climate action. So to me, the state is really the most interesting level. And here's part of the reason, next slide, 
why we have so much obstruction and delay in Washington, D.C., of course, is the difficulty in getting those 60 votes in the Senate. Um, that makes this man uh, extremely powerful, as everybody knows too well. Next slide. And here's what happens uh, every time that there's uh, a, a possibility of real climate change uh, action happening is that the lobbying money flows. This is from a research by Bob Brule, who I brought to Brown University about three years ago and is my co-collaborator on the Climate Social Science Network and in the Climate and Development Lab. So when the Waxman-Markey bill was starting to move through Congress in 2008, 2009, um, the money started just uh, booming. It went from below 50 to over $350 million a year. And notice that it dropped, but it never went back to the same levels that it was before. So because, and the reason why it dropped is because there was just almost no opportunity, no chance of real meaningful climate legislation. Next slide. So looking at the state level is, to me as a social scientist, uh, great, but you've got 50 cases that are each have these varying combinations of dependency on fossil fuels, um, different political control, different levels of urbanization, you know, threats from coastal sea level rise, um, you know, inland flooding, droughts, um, opportunities with, uh, you know, renewable energy in sunnier places, and uh, and then there's this access to um, legislators, um, to staff, to agency heads um, in Rhode Island. It's it's pretty stunning, and I think. For my students, it's a, a real opportunity to make a difference and to get to know how the sausage is made. Um, I guess I'll, the, a couple, there's more points here, but one of the things is that the lobbying records can be extraordinary. And Massachusetts, in fact, has uh, some of the best lobbying records in the country um, because it allows us to tie the companies that paid for the lobbyists with lobbyists and then what positions they took on every bill. So there's only five states in the country with that good data. And that's just um, kind of luck uh, in our case uh, for this study. The committee testimony is public, but we, we, were, we spent all last summer, that is 2019, while the state house was still open, um, in the library and going and visiting state committee rooms, um, begging them literally to give us their, all the written testimony that they had because they don't have to give it to us. So transparency on testimony and on uh, votes and so on, and on the, of course, the, the proceedings of the really important committees, as we're gonna see, is pretty terrible. So there's a real mixed picture in Massachusetts here. So there's much more to talk about here, um, but I'm gonna move on. Um, we think of Massachusetts as sort of a, a best case scenario. I mean, it's uh, one of the most liberal states. It's not afraid to be a leader, at least sometimes on some very historic, uh, legislation and it's got this mobilized civil society, which I think is really impressive. Um, so, and it's got no, you know, uh, extraction or major processing of fossil fuels. So it's, uh, you know, it's a case where we should be seeing a lot of climate action and leadership and yet the state really did fall behind um, kind of since the, over the teens from uh, after it passed the the, one of the first in the country, Global Warming Solutions Act in 2008. Next. So we have a couple of research questions. Who supports and opposes climate and clean energy legislation? How do they interact? Who are the groups? So what do, what do they want? What, what groups focus on which issues and how do they argue for their priorities? Um, and then who are the winners and losers? How do the winners use the legis pro legislative process to get what they want? And again, we think we need to study the opposition so that the uh, those who want positive change to take place can be more effective. So that's my pitch and I'm gonna hand it over to Galen um, to take it forward. Thanks Timmons. And can someone just give me a thumbs up that you can hear me all right? Yeah, we're hearing you. Yes, great, thanks. So I'm going to cover our attempt to answer the first of our questions, which is who supports and opposes climate and clean energy legislation. So this is going to involve first a sort of deep dive into our analysis and then we'll come back out and see what the takeaways are. So you'll sort of bear with me and the picture will become clear if it's not originally. So I'll start off just by talking about the framing of the study and the data that we're looking at. So as Tim and said, we were blessed in Massachusetts with a very high resolution, high fidelity data set of lobbying records that we used as part of the, the sort of backbone of this study. And we looked at those records in the period 2013 to 2018. 
So uh, maybe some of you remember this is coming off the tail end of the um, the whole offshore wind farm fight. There's some small movement on climate change in the legislature during this period, but not very much. Um, and we want to know why is there so much gridlock. So the lobbying records that we're looking at include information on which clients or interest groups, so for example, the utility Eversource paid for lobbying, which firms they paid, which lobbyists those firms hired, whether those lobbyists registered support, neutrality, or opposition for any number of bills. And we looked through all the legislation over this time period and picked 291 bills, including amendments and iteration, iterations of bills that were uh, relating to climate change or clean energy. And then we added in data on votes, committees, sponsors, and outcomes of those bills from the service legiscan. So the first sort of high level takeaway, easy takeaway from this data is just that clean energy advocates are vastly outspent on lobbying. So what we're seeing here is at the top, uh, top advocates for clean energy policies ranked by the number of clean energy policies they supported in lobbying over the time period and the total they spent over the time period in the bars. At bottom, we see the top opposition to clean energy, same, same idea. Um, and the main difference here is just that the top advocates are outspent about 3.5 to 1 by the opposition. And in fact, if you remove the Mass Municipal Association, which is a bit of an outlier and focused only on, on one set of issues, that, that ratio grows to 6 to 1. So there's just a vast imbalance on the playing field of, of lobbying with regards to climate change. Um, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the data to get at the relationships between these groups and how they uh, agree and disagree over particular issues. So what you're seeing here is a sample of our data set. Um, the two nodes in gray are two interest groups, so Environmental League of Massachusetts and National Grid, which is a utility. And all the little black dots represent bills that they lobbied on. The lines to the black dots just show the position that they lobbied. So green means that they lobbied in support of that bill. Red means that they opposed it. And there are some blue ones here that mean they registered neutral lobbying. So we have a large data set of records like this that link interest groups to bills. If we take those records and look at each pair of interest groups, we can count the number of agreements and disagreements that they had on all climate legislation. So when they both oppose a bill, that's an agreement. When they both support it, that's an agreement. And then if they have different positions, that's a disagreement. Mm -hmm. What we did was iterate over all of those agreements and disagreements to come up with a massive network that just links every interest group involved in climate and clean energy. That's 160 in total, um, based on how much they agree minus how much they disagree. And then we used a method of network analysis called InfoMap, which if anyone wants to get into the technicalities, we can in the questions, to find the sort of natural groupings of interest groups based on the interest groups who tend to agree with each other a ton should be grouped together. They have similar preferences on policies and the ones that oppose each other a ton should be far away. What we found is that there are nine sort of uh, representative coalitions of actors who are engaged in climate and clean energy here. Um, I'm not going to get into all of them right now. We can later again, but two important ones are the Social Green Coalition, which is 35 progressive and environmental groups, and the utilities who are sort of centered on Eversource National Grid and the Business Association um, Associated Industries in Massachusetts. So um, this is just another way of looking at the same data. It's Right now, the pie graphs just show the distribution of lobbying within the group, so support, oppose, and, and neutral. And um, the way we chose to divide up these groups is in, uh, sort of for, for analytical purposes, is a green coalition and what we call an anti-green coalition. So the green coalition is those groups of uh, corporations and lobbyists who tend to support clean energy centered on these social greens and they include automakers who support EVs, hydro and wind groups, solar, and so on. And then the anti-green groups are those who tend to oppose the social greens. So these include real estate companies, power generators, fossil and chemical producers, and utilities. Uh, just to give you a sense of who we're actually, the specifics of who we're actually talking about here, the most active pro-climate members are Environmental League of Massachusetts, Clean Water Action, and Conservation Law Foundation. And the most active members of the opposition are National Grid, American Petroleum Institute, and Eversource. Um, what we 
we're able to do after that is then look do the same analysis but only with a particular subset of bills so what we just this little animation shows us selecting those bills that are related to hydro and wind power um, so we can do the same kind of make the same sort of network to get at how groups are related within the domain of a particular kind of bill and here's what that looks like when we look at just hydro and wind bills there is a strong amount of agreement between social greens utilities and hydro and wind uh, producers what that means is that on the particular issue of hydro and wind legislation the utilities who mostly oppose social greens actually support them and they support the expansion of hydro and wind and that puts them in conflict with power fossil fuel power generators in the state conversely when we look at solar power bills so utilities historically dislike solar um, we see, as we would expect, strong opposition from utilities to the social greens and the solar, and that is similar to the opposition coming from power generation. So this is a sense of this sort of interest that each group is bringing to bear. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Trevor now to talk a little bit more about what we found in testimony. Great. Um, so in addition to looking at lobbying data, we also looked at testimony. Um, testimony is another way that organizations, individuals give input on legislation. Um, it also really complements our lobbying information that we got because testimony not only includes the position they took on the bill, but also the arguments that they used, um, the topics that they're talking about in particular. Um, so we can move to the next slide. So as Tim and said, we went to the state house about a dozen times to request testimony. Um, and we focused on bills that environmental groups saw as a priority from 2013 to 2018. So it's about 50 bills. And so for each piece of testimony we got, we looked at who testified, we looked at the position they took on the bills that were related to climate and clean energy, and then we also looked at the arguments that they made. The result is about 1,400 positions on the bills that we were looking at. So we can move to the next slide. Um, so this is just a summary graph um, showing the testimony overall over these six years. So in green here is support for an environmental group Red is opposition and gray is neutral. The first big thing that really jumps out here, right, is that almost all the testimony was supporting environmental groups. That was true across different sessions, across different issues. We saw really strong support um, for climate action. The second big thing here is that some sectors mostly give testimony against environmentalists. Um, so these are the heating oils, fossil fuels, utilities, and real estate. Um, so, right, so these are some similar names that we saw in the lobbying data. The difference here is that these numbers are really small. This is over six years, over 50 bills, right? So the utility is only showing up um, 13 times, right? It's pretty small. Um, so we, we infer, right, that they're using other avenues like lobbying, like other, like campaign finance, et cetera. They're not really bothering even to show up in testimony or in these hearings. Um, and then the third big thing we're seeing is that individuals, a lot of individuals show up in support of climate action, um, and most of the opposition that we saw from individuals was on a set of um, wind siting bills in 2013, which is an important issue. Um, but other than those testimony on those bills, only four people testified against environmentalists on climate legislation for everything else. So really, if we're thinking about constituents, voters, input on climate legislation, we're seeing really, really strong support for action. So we can move forward. Cool. So integrating our lobbying data as well as our testimony, um, we wanted to understand what the anti-green coalition actually wants, right? We got a little bit of that from the network analysis that we did. Um, and so we're just gonna synthesize these um, for the opposition coalitions. So the first one, so utilities. So utilities are supporting large scale hydro and wind, but really strongly attacking solar. They also look to um, control energy efficiency policies. So you can see here in this quote from the testimony, um, they say, we can do the same for the environment, but at a fraction of the cost with more wind than solar, right? So this is a pretty neutral tone. This is just about the cost of energy. Um, but we know from their lobbying that they're really strongly attacking solar. They see solar as a threat to their industry. Um, and they're pushing back more than just saying, oh, the costs are different. We just think wind's a better choice. Um, so next, um, so if the fossil fuel industry is looking really to block threats to the industry, they almost never supported a bill um, at all. They're really just like on the defense. 
they see that climate action is coming. Um, they see all these pushes to reduce the use of fossil fuels and they're pushing back. So they give these kind of wild quotes in their testimony. They say there's enormous social benefits to using fossil fuels. They say if fossil fuel use were it to end tomorrow, the economic consequences would be catastrophic. Um, kind of projecting some sort of like doomsday technology, doomsday scenario where we can't really operate society without fossil fuels. Um, so you can see like they're a little bit more scared than the utilities when it comes to what's going on at the state house. And then the third is real estate. Um, the real estate industry um, also showed up pretty strongly against climate legislation. They're really just focused on building energy efficiency laws, both for residential um, and for some commercial buildings as well. Um, they see here they're using kind of like social justice sounding argument, so in the widening of the gap between the haves and the have nots. Um, we didn't see this argument from any actual social justice organizations or individuals, um, but they're trying to leverage this kind of language um, to protect their profits and their ability to do what they want to do. Great. So I'm going to end us off by talking about who actually wins in the legislature. And if you follow Massachusetts state politics, you might have an idea of who we're talking about. Um, so we're again, this just shows the nine different coalitions that we identified earlier. Um, what we did was we looked at every bill that each coalition lobbied on, and we asked whether if they supported it, it moved up through the legislature, so to the next committee or to a floor vote. And if they opposed it, did it die at that committee? Um, so sort of skipping over the details of the actual regression, what we find is that some groups are, some uh, coalitions are far more successful than others in, uh, in that their favored bills move and their opposed bills die. And the most successful of all is the utilities. Again, when I say it shouldn't be a surprise, um, in many states, researchers are finding that utilities are sort of the dominant political force in the climate and clean energy um, uh, domain. Uh, like Timmons just held up a great book by the scholar Leah Stokes, who's also in the Climate Social Science Network called Short Circuiting Climate Policy, also similar, similar lines. So um, now we want to know how does this uh, success that utilities find actually happen in the legislature and where does it happen? What can we find out about it? What can we not find out about it? Um, so to do that, we need to have a little bit of background on the uh, structure of the legislature, so how bills move uh, forward through the legislature. So I'm going to review that really quickly. At the beginning of each session, dozens and dozens of climate bills specifically are introduced. So over the three sessions that we looked at, um, I think 276 bills were introduced, and then there were sort of iterations of them later on. And each of those bills is referred to a joint committee. So the most common joint committee is the Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy Committee. That's where the public hearings are held. There's also all kinds of lobbying and negotiations that go on that aren't public. And then sometime later, a small subset of those bills is moved out of that committee, and they might be amended in various ways. Um, and they eventually make it to gateway committees like the House and Senate Ways and Means. Those committees have to each decide that a bill is worth a floor vote. If it passes the floor vote, then it goes to the governor and the governor can choose whether to sign veto or, or propose amendments. So right now we're in the stage where the governor, I think, has vetoed with amendments on the climate bill. Um, and um, now we're going to look at the actual flow of legislation uh, through each of these committees in the data set that we're talking about. Okay. So I know this slide is kind of has a lot going on. So we're starting out looking at all the introduced bills over all three sessions on the left-hand side. Most of those bills go to the TUE committee, Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy, and some go to other joint committees. Now, a much smaller subset go to Ways and Means committees, which have to refer them back to the other committee in order to approve them. And then an even smaller subset get a floor vote, and then all but one of them were signed and one had amendments. Um, now, the important thing here is that there are four key decision points along the process where bills can either move or die. They can move out of joint committees, and what we know about what happens there is mostly what we can learn from hearings. We don't know what kinds of negotiations go on, and we don't know how committee members vote on bills to move forward or die. Then they have to go to Ways and Means committees 
we don't have we know basically nothing about what happens in the House Ways and Means Committee. We know I think we have votes in the Senate Ways and Means Committee, but not much else. And then they go to a floor vote. And the reason that there's a question mark on the floor vote here is that Massachusetts often votes uh, using voice votes, which happens so fast that you literally cannot follow them. And in fact, there are no recorded um, uh, voice votes. So you don't even have a count of the yeas or nays sometimes. So again, we don't know very much about what's actually going on on the floor. Um, but what we do know is how interest groups lobbied. So what I'm going to do now is color in this graph showing the positions that utilities took on bills at each stage. And I'll just point you to the pattern that, that comes out of this. So among introduced bills, um, utilities uh, vastly either oppose, which is, is in red, or are neutral on the bills that go to the TUE committee. They don't really care about many of the bills in the other committees. Um, although among those they do care about, they tend to oppose them. So again, introduced bills, utilities tend to oppose them. But look at the bills that come out of the TUE committee, and you see a lot more green than red. And then if you look even further on in the process, by the time you get to floor votes, utilities only oppose a single bill, and they supported all the others that got to floor votes. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is just show a picture of um, success in the legislature, right? At each of these four key decision points, um, particular interest groups are benefiting, and we can see that and measure it. What we don't know is actually why they're benefiting or what legislators are talking about in these committees or how they're making their decisions. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Trevor to sort of summarize for us. Great. Um, so this is really just a summary slide kind of summing up what we've talked about and answering our research questions. So for who supports and opposes climate and clean energy legislation, we're seeing a green coalition, um, of these names that Galen has kind of talked us through, as well as an anti-green coalition really led and dominated by the utilities. Um, when we look at what these groups want, utilities are benefiting from some renewables, really attacking solar, and they're looking really to overall manage um, the energy system in the state. Fossil fuel industry is on the defensive, pushing back against threats. Real estate industry is really just focused on energy efficiency. Um, and we also see power generators mostly pushing back again against competition to their existing generation. Um, and by power generators, we mean like mostly fossil fuel power generators. And then third, who are the winners and losers? Utilities are the biggest winners um, and they have the most resources. Um, they're often perceived as experts by legislators. So they kind of have some clouds there as well. Um, and they manage the grid as a whole. Um, so really utilities are the, are the players that we looked at the most dominant and most successful. And we see that in many different data sets that we've looked at. Um, so with that, um, I think we're going to close the presentation part. Um, this is our report, and I'll share a link to that report, as well as a link to a news article kind of summarizing the report as well in the chat. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for, for being here, for your time, and we're really excited to answer questions and talk more. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your deep dive there. You're seriously galvanizing research, your analysis, and your insights. I certainly think that we will want to hear you talk about some of your recommendations uh, directly to activists. And um, I am going to ask Michelle to get us started. So uh, as I was watching, um your presentation i was looking at that photograph of all of those wonderful uh citizens coming out uh to attend the public hearing and knowing how they felt because at times i've been at those public hearings and then you know uh, putting that image of all these dedicated citizens against uh the results um is as pretty disheartening so I think I'd like to hear from the three of you regarding your assessment regarding this last climate bill that has languished, it's sputtered, it's gone back and forth, and uh, we're still waiting for it to uh, achieve final passage. I'm wondering if you have any comments about whether or not uh, this bill that is about to be passed, we think, this upcoming week, maybe on Thursday is what I read last, 
Um, is there any any hope with the passage of this bill that says the legislature is in fact listening more to activists as, and the citizenry who really do want uh, climate action measures to be taken? Or is the stranglehold of the utilities and the real estate industry, is that presenting any progress from being made? If you could weigh in on that, that would be great. So I'm gonna take a first quick swing, Michelle, thanks. Um, uh, this bill does some it does strengthen Massachusetts um, position and its goals, and it has some specific things about dealing with environmental justice and with giving some power to municipalities, for example, to to impose stronger building codes, uh, for example, for net zero homes, which is a huge deal. And in fact, those were some of the things that that Governor Baker mentioned in his four page letter right around New Year's, wasn't it, when he uh, when he um, uh, vetoed the, the first version of this thing, um, that is from the very end of the last legislative session. Um, clearly the real estate industry had, and the developers, the builders had his ear uh, and were very effective at getting to him um, in, in, having, uh, in, in suggesting that he veto the bill and that he went ahead and did so. So I think it's it's it was a big deal that the legislature quickly got busy. Um, so, you know, Senator Bennett was just d d dogged and um, got this thing back on the agenda and got it passed again. You know, so so early in a new session is remarkable because as everybody who's been through this knows, they usually hold all the bills till the very very end, right? So they can make sure that all the legislators are being good boys and girls and voting the way they're supposed to and behaving as they're supposed to if they want their own bills to to move. So anyway, I think it's it is actually pretty inspiring that they moved it quickly and that you know now he's blocking it again. I think we'll hear more uh, later from um, Jacob Stern from Sierra Club who can give us a real briefing on on his thoughts about this, but um, I would say it's a good sign. It, it's and I think any politician right now, especially Democrats, have to be aware that this issue is one where they cannot be on the on the on the wrong side of history and a laggard. It doesn't work anymore. I mean, this is there's a and it, it started with the sunrise movement of young people, but it's 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 always been a large group of uh, Democrats who who are very strongly in favor of uh, you know ambitious climate action that's based on the science, and that's what we're finally talking about. Just one thing, I mean, Charlie Baker was pushing for a 45% target by 2030, 45% emission reductions, whereas the legislature's bill had 50%. I was on a call last week uh, about Nigeria, uh, a huge oil producer in Africa. Uh, their climate target is 45% by 2030. Now, if Massachusetts can't do better than Nigeria, um, you know, that's, that's pretty sad, so. Great, thank you, KLM. So I am going to start with a specific, obviously we cannot ask all the questions. Thank you, you so responded with so many questions. I will try to ask a representative sample topic wise, Clearly, many people are asking about what is, what are the tactics now? What do we do now? Um, I will defer most of those questions, I think, to the breakout groups where we will really talk about tactics and you will be able to unmute yourselves and ask some of those questions again. But one of the things that truly intrigues me and one of the questions that is here is what makes the utilities, I think you mentioned one thing, what makes them the dominant political force here? How have they achieved that status with our legislators and the governor? Galen? I'd be happy to jump in on this uh, a little and then Timmons and Trevor can follow up or, and or correct me. Um, so the first thing to note is that um, that's a great question and we should be asking it about every state, um, or at least every state in which the, there are regulated utilities. Um, so we, this might be old hat for some people, but 
with regulated utilities, um, the the sort of market for electricity and gas is not really a market. What it actually is is that utilities like Eversource and National Grid have a mandated monopoly over the distribution of electricity and gas on their grids, right? And they get to make investments and then demand that ratepayers pay them back. And the way that they that regulated utilities work with, um, uh, I think it's the PUC in Massachusetts, but the utilities regulating body, um, the way that they work with that body basically grants them massive influence in the state over energy policy because they have to work directly with the state to set um, both investment schedules of any kind in their grid and to set prices. So when the legislature or the executive agencies are considering a change that's going to affect the grid, they have to go to the utilities as opposed to like power generators, um, you know, uh, uh, one particular solar farm or another, like those can be, there can be, they can be replaced, they can be taken on or off, but the grid kind of, I think one interviewee for our study said they, they literally own the railroad. So um, that's kind of why they have so much structural power. And just one more thing on that is that, um, you know, if as experts kind of think we have to do, we really just straightforwardly reduce energy consumption in Massachusetts. Um, that means that ultimately there's going to be declining investment in bringing new features online to the grid. And because regulated utilities are just paid for the investments that they make in the grid, then um, declining investments just means sort of a mandated decline in the amount of, uh, of money that utilities are given for those investments. And so that's something that they're going to fight for a long time because um, it's a really deep threat to their companies. Just, just in very simple terms, uh, Galen, that was great. Um, the utilities are there lobbying year in and year out, and they have the best professional lobbyists with the deepest connections with the administration and with the legislature. So over the, the time period uh, of just six years, Eversource spent you know $2.2 million. Um, the National Grid spent $1.3 million. Um, and it goes on from there. Anyway, it was, we have it all in that in that table that that uh, Galen put up. The, but they are consistent spenders. For example, pipeline companies will spend a lot of money right when they're trying to get their pipelines cited, um, and then they, you know, slack off when they're not trying to cite a pipeline. But we think that the strategy of the um, of the utilities is is pretty smart. I mean, to, to build to these relationships and uh, well to and buy a lot of them, um, and then to keep keep paying for them. One thing is though that they're using our ratepayer money to do this lobbying. So I think, you know, as as the regulated utility, they should whatever this relationship needs to be looked at and um, and adjusted. Okay. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Jean Kempthorne. What were the most notable impediments to your research on climate action? Trevor, you want to go with that? Yeah. So there were quite a few, unfortunately. Um, so I think one of the big ones is that, right? So as Galen was talking about, all the places where decisions are made. Most of the time, we don't know how legislators are voting or the conversations that they're having. So we can say a lot about what we think groups want and what they're spending money on, their resources, their interests, um, but actually the mechanism by which they're able to influence a legislator, the meetings where they actually decide what moves forward and what doesn't. We've heard in interviews, right? Some of say like, if AIM doesn't support a bill, it usually doesn't move forward and there's shouting matches and AIM usually wins in those shouting matches. Um, we only really know that from interviews and we don't know that right for the whole wealth of, the whole body of legislation we're looking at. Um, other big thing is that, so for testimony in particular, um, testimony, we spend a lot of time just requesting testimony from the legislature. Um, a lot of it had just been discarded. A lot of it we weren't able to get um, in Connecticut or just as an example of one state uh, that does a better job, all the testimony is available online. All the hearings have official transcripts. 
um, and all the committee votes are also publicly available on this tally sheet you can see my legislator voted this way on this bill. Um, so I think there are groups like Act on Massachusetts, other groups that are working on transparency um, for a lot of different reasons, um, but it's definitely something that Massachusetts really lags behind many other states on. So I want to follow up on that with a question that may not be answerable by you, Martha Nathan. Martha Nathan, Marty, I think, is asking, what is the response if you have any idea of legislators, if they are asked, why is so much of this positive testimony not effective or ignored? What does that look like? You said, you know, more than 90% of the testimony is positive. Um, let me let me take a small uh, slice of this. Um, I'm expecting puzzled faces on this yeah. one because I think it's unanswerable, but it must be asked. Well, the the power is so concentrated in the hands of the leadership um, that literally the the hearings we almost came away with the feeling that they were theater, that they were just to give the impression of input from the public. That it's on the other hand, you know, activists said it's a good hearing with a big showing and great testimony is a necessary but in no way sufficient. Um, you know, requirement to get your bill moving. Uh, the legislators are largely told what to do by the leadership, whether the leadership wants to get it through or not. And the, um, that's, that's what we heard. I do think there's this important issue of the House versus, you know, the General Assembly versus the, the Senate, that the Senate has a, a little bit more open process, but, um, and is uh, more willing to put forward more progressive uh, climate legislation. Uh, but the House holds the keys to the budget and has, in, in the end, uh, literally all the power. I don't know, I'm oversimplifying, but. Not at all, I don't think. Um, we have a question about why um, the utilities are not in favor of solar. Why is solar the, a bad boy as opposed to hydro and wind? I really want to talk about this for a second because it's it's just because they can't charge for rooftop solar. If it's behind your meter, if it's on your roof, then it's meaning you're having to buy your less electricity from them. So they're getting to sell you less stuff, less of their product. It's That's pretty much it. I, I did want to add one other point to what Galen said before. Um, in general, renewable energy developers are afraid to cross the utilities because the utility they need the utilities to hook up their wind turbines or their solar farm to the grid. And and National Grid or you know Eversource can drag their feet, and it can basically drive these companies out of business or really cut their profit margin if the if they can't get their um, uh, you know their whatever it is their renewable energy hooked up so the anyway this these utilities have incredible power and so one thing we noticed was that the for example the wind guys don't show up for the solar bills or they don't show up on carbon pricing or you know or, or omnibus climate bills that would really help their energy source. They just don't testify very much. So one of our recommendations is to really bring these clean energy companies in to try to help them uh, be protected against the utilities. Um, they're talking about a new bill here in, in Rhode Island to, um, to, to take it out of the utilities hands on how the interconnection is gonna happen and when. So that the, that utilities cannot, um, control these these uh, green energy companies, which some of them did spend some money on lobbying, um, but they were very particular in only lobbying for their industrial in interests, which I, we think is a real shame. Because right. if they would work together with the others, I think it'd be much more powerful. Right. So I would just like to let everyone know that we will save this chat. Uh, there is so much going on in the chat. 
Um, and we really appreciate that. I hope that um, you will not be too annoyed that we have limited the chat to a certain extent so we can truly listen to the answers. And we will have time to chat like crazy in the breakout rooms. Uh, now, here's a very specific question about the federal legislation, which I think you've touched on. Um, Douglas Johnson is asking specifically, are there federal bills now, which if passed, would force states to do more on climate action? What is the connection there? Galen, you want to go? Well, I haven't been following the most recent developments. The most Okay, the most up-to-date thing I know, and you should take this with a grain of salt because we're sort of focused at the state level right now, is that there aren't there aren't bills with a serious chance of passage right now, at least, that are being considered that would have um, that would be able to force states to act like that. Um, but there is talk in in the sort of second stage of the Biden economic stimulus plan of including massive incentives for. Um, I'm not sure about state policies, but for renewable technology development and procurement at the federal level, which would like, if that happened, would be a massive boon to states that do want to act. Yeah, I think all the eyes are on that um, infrastructure stimulus bill right now. Yeah. There's lots of legislation and again, yeah, the Senate has bottled it up. And then there's, you know, yeah, even conservative uh, Democrats from fossil fuel producing and energy heavy using states that make it quite difficult. So focusing again on our climate obstructors, climate obstruction actors, I have a question from Amy Loisel, who says she notes a lot of resistance for utility changes from major construction and utility unions. And she wonders, uh, she notes that these unions are known to be less progressive and more in line with commercial real estate and wonders, do you have any research on their impact on climate change legislation here? So I have I just the anecdotal really, stuff, but yeah, you wanna go ahead? Yeah. Well, I could just speak really briefly on the lobbying that um, union construction and like utility adjacent unions, like the pipe fitters, they don't show up to lobby that often. Um, we have found, I think they they may have supported, if not directly, at least indirectly, the the Massachusetts Sustainable uh, Coalition for Sustainable Energy, which was a front group established to support um, further pipelines in Massachusetts. But um, yeah, we don't. But we do see um, occasionally uh, nursing unions and other kinds of. Uh, not really related labor unions show up to support climate action and actually they supported pension divestment um, a while ago. So that was good to see. Okay. Um, sorry, just, I guess one other thing on that. Um, I think there, there are many different labor groups, right? So the utilities are also like not great to labor groups as well. Um, the national grid lockout of the steel workers union um, is a really local example of that. Um, I think there's really great examples of like labor and environmental group, um, environmental groups working together to build like a stronger coalition. Um, so definitely like unions like the pipe fitters tend to support fitting more pipes. Um, but there are, we did see some labor support for climate action. And I think there's other, there's hopeful examples um, for future collaborations in that arena. And I think, you know, both of this and this focus and the focus on the utilities talk point to the value of having a positive um, project for those groups to work on. So for example, I'm, I'm getting around to talking about the environmental group HEAT uh, and their focus on geothermal uh, micro districts. So using existing pipes or having the utilities actually provide, you know, sort of geothermal energy to a neighborhood or to a large facility and a bunch of homes around it. Um, and uh, the Gas Leak Allies group in Massachusetts is, is also supporting that. And I think that's quite interesting because then it, it does create a new role for utilities in the, you know, a, a low carbon future. And, and certainly there's gonna be a ton of pipe fitting work to be done. Um, you know, I, there, there have been some real divisive issues over power plants um, and pipelines with the unions, but um, you know, sometimes you're right, the, the, the unions, uh, do 
line up for climate legislation. And I guess I would say it's important for climate activists to line up in support of the union issues too. It can't be just expected to be a one-way street. Okay, so now here's a question from Ernesto Cruz uh, from Neighbor to Neighbor. His question is to you, but also something that I think you would like to hear discussed in front of the group and probably will bring up in a breakout session. His question, my question is how do we avoid getting caught up in endless insincere debates with utilities and special interests? The movement toward climate equity often spins its wheels wanting to argue points with them that we see here can be meaningless. Is there an overview suggestion? How do we, do we need to continue to debate with these actors? So that's a really good question. I can say a, a tiny bit about it. Um, I think so with fossil fuel companies, there's been a real push right to just delegitimize them. We're moving beyond fossil fuels, we're divesting. Um, they try all sorts of arguments and I think debating with them, some, like there are so groups that do it and push back, um, but debating with them is somewhat like debating against people who are really committed to climate denial, that it's not a super great use of their time. With utilities, they do have some interest in renewable generation because they can build a transmission line, right? So both for large scale wind, large scale hydro, there's huge transmission projects that they wanna build, they wanna profit from, and that, so they're lobbying and support. Um, we can ask a question of, do we want them to make so much profit off of the renewable projects? Um, but there is, I think, more nuance there with their actions. I think for solar, their arguments are pretty disingenuous. As Timmons was saying, there's a really clear reason why they don't like solar. Um, and I think publicizing that reason and that logic of why utility companies are bad actors um, on solar and some of these other um, important climate issues is really important. And doing that right outside of the utilities because I think the public image of utilities is like, they're the company I pay for my electricity and gas, and I don't know that much more about them as opposed to the huge push there's been to educate people about like the damages of the fossil fuel industry. So I think a lot of that education um, and awareness of the utilities role is really important. Um, and not just to get caught up debating with their lobbyists because their they're lobbyists are very well paid. They, they have arguments all day. <laughs> so would you, outline the primary suggestions that you and conclusions for action that you suggest in your report. So I'll, I'll take a first dive and these guys can pick it up because I don't want to rattle off all six, but we have six. One, support Im sharply improved transparency. And so this is going to help all, you know, all the progressive or groups hoping to understand, even just for democracy's sake, you know, there's uh, things like committee hearings should be recorded and broadcast over the internet. You know, some of these things that are being done finally for um, COVID reasons should be continued. Reporting of all lobbying activities needs to be far more detailed. Um, lobbying records, uh oh, this is, I'm still on uh, number one here. Lobbying records should be cleaned and made consistent with tools for analysis on state supplied websites. I mean, Galen, this is just on an, unbelievable job of cleaning up and processing these databases and merging them with these other, with LegisCAN, for example, committee votes and, and public votes. So, so transparency is, the, is really the top, the top one. The second one that I like to talk about is, is this capacity is needed in the stakeholder organizations. I mean, here we have this massive utility, you know, arguing against a group of citizens. It's, there needs to be really some support for building technical capacity and legal capacity in citizens groups. California has a good example um, where they actually uh, have money set aside to support those organizations to be able to show up at the key hearings in the Public Utilities Commission and uh, with that technical and, uh, um, and, and legal capacity, but I think also you know, these groups need to, when they can, invest in lobbying and groups, you know, like it or not, need to play the game of campaign finance. I mean, this is me now talking for myself, from my own experience from Rhode Island is, uh, you know, the other side is using a lot of campaign finance. And if you're not, um, if you're not doing that, you're not, 
really playing the, the game to win. Um, so Galen, you want to pick up an, another one or two? Sure. So um, again, Tim has mentioned this earlier, and I, I didn't really get into it when we sh were showing the slides, but renewable energy companies don't show up that often to support anything outside of their sort of narrow purview. So having, um, and, and I should add, they have large budgets to pay for lobbyists, some of them. So having support from those companies on sort of a broader range of legislation and regulatory changes would be um, would be helpful. But the other thing that, you know, in the absence of that support that advocates can do themselves is just learn a little bit more about utilities. It's like one of the least sexy topics on <laughs> earth. <laughs> I know after having <laughs> read a lot about it, right? Um, but there are great people like writers like David Roberts, who was at Vox for a while, and I think just started an independent publication, but people who break down how utilities actually work. That way, if you're an advocate and you're talking to someone trying to convince them to support a bill, if they're a legislator or to support a campaign, then you can actually um, respond when they give you some canned uh, utility talking point, right? So the idea that like, the idea that we shouldn't think about electricity prices as determined in the free market, it's fundamentally just set by the regulators and the utilities when they determine what investments they can make, right? There's like a different way of thinking about how decisions are made here. And we need to understand that in order to come to arguments, you know, well prepared. That being said, I don't think it fundamentally comes down to arguing successfully against utilities directly, but I think sort of understanding the structure of your of your opposition is important. Yeah. So Trevor, can you talk about the sort of understanding the discourses of delay and the um, the yeah the last narrative point on our recommendations? Sure. Yeah. So um, through the testimony that we looked at and other sources, there's a kind of an international team of scholars looking at discourses of delay, um, and there's most companies that are pushing back against climate action and in, in the United States, particularly in places like New England, are not denying climate change, but they're really just using a variety of different strategies to delay action as much as possible. This can be pointing at other countries. Um, this can be where saying that this industry is already doing great work, leveraging social justice arguments in ways that are disingenuous and not actually matching what's going on. Um, so there's a variety of different strategies. I think it's really important for activists to know about those strategies um, and to push back and not to say, oh, they're not denying climate change. That seems positive. Um, we're gonna give them a pass or something like that. Um, and I can share a resource with more of some of these like discourses of delay. Um, I think the other, the other big thing is not just knowing about the discourses, but really publicizing um, these industries. Um, a lot of times, organizations support climate action, support legislation, and then it dies and they don't really know who's behind it dying. Um, a good starting guess is that the utilities are behind it dying in Massachusetts. Um, and so really some putting some pressure on these companies, um, particularly utilities and other industries that don't have the same pressure that fossil fuels do. Um, and there are a variety of ways to kind of rein back, rein in the utilities. Those can be limiting their lobbying, um, building, kind of like organizations, institutional knowledge. This can be democratizing the grid and taking over the grid. There's many options to kind of rein in the utilities, um, but I think there's a real need to look into those options because um, right now the status quo really benefits them and they have the, all the resources to continue doing that. So final question here, and then we will move on to our breakout groups where we can truly all go nuts in the chat and talk. We will probably have to raise hands, but we will be able to dig more into individual issues. A question from Aaron Fried, actually two. What is the single most effective action we can take as voters in the short term and in the long term? Can you articulate a single most? <laughs> it's a tough, right? Is there a way to frame it very broadly? I mean, I'll jump in real quick. And the, the canned response I always give is you have to join a group that's taking action. Um, there's 
it, it is a category error to think that of this as an issue for individual action to solve. It's, it's about group action. So there are tons of groups in Springfield and elsewhere, um, like y'all and, and um, just loads of people in Massachusetts who are taking this on, so. Wonderful. Thank you. Anybody else want to take a shot? No, that was what we were going to say, I think, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's safety in numbers and there's thinking in numbers. It only gets and done in numbers, right? It only gets done. It's done in numbers. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your deep dive. Again, will you put the link to your full report, which is full of so many more details and also um, all the slides and more that you've seen. Uh, someone had asked to have a slide repeated. That will be mm -hmm. in the report, beautifully illustrated. Fantastic data wrangling, really. Thank you so much. So we're resharing that note. Uh, and the wheels are turning, the wheels were turning and continue to turn in our uh, groups. So hopefully uh, your prediction is going to come true, Linda, that everybody will leave enthusiastic and encouraged and animated to keep on going. So I would like to thank everyone for attending and uh, a special thanks to all who made the evening possible, our tech team especially the incomparable Irvine Sobelman, our breakout moderators, and of course, the Brown team of analysts who've taken the time to share the results of what is truly a deep dive into Massachusetts politics. Murky waters, <laughs> indeed, uh, with all of us tonight. I wanna let everyone know that we did record this event, uh, the plenary session and uh, the Q&A that followed it. And that recording is going to be posted on the website, websites and Facebook pages of the Longmeadow Democratic Town Committee and also the Springfield Democratic City Committee. So the websites and Facebook pages of both groups will have a link to those recordings. And I think that'll be very helpful. And I would like, before we close, to make a special appeal to Democrats on this call to make climate activism part of your work locally on also the state level. Consider, let's push this as Democrats, consider inviting our climate activists to offer regular updates at your committee meetings, form climate action subcommittees if you don't have them, be in contact with your legislators on climate issues. Let them know, make them know that we're watching and advocating and ask them to meet with you and discuss these issues. As a committee, there's force in numbers. And if you're not a member of a democratic town or city ward committee, but you identify as a Democrat and you'd like to help move us Democrats more toward this kind of persistent climate activism, just message me and I'll hook you up. You can always find me on the Springfield City Committee Facebook page, or you can message us on the website. And climate activists, as a final thought, I would ask you to consider affirmatively reaching out to your local democratic town and city committees. Social activists, community activists, I would ask you to leave no democratic committee untouched. Inform them, involve them in your efforts. If you identify as a Democrat yourself, I would ask you to please consider joining a local committee to make your voice heard on a regular basis within the Democratic community and help us move and support the party and the Democratic effort to center climate as a local state and national priority. We think we have some wind beneath our wings with our new Biden-Harris administration.
So in closing, I would like to say, thank you all, planet patriots, farewell. <laughs>